So my presentation is called Why Black and White? And let me get my cursor here. So to understand black and white, we first must examine the history of black and white. We need to undertake a comparative and historical analysis with an emphasis on the relative intrinsic value of the inherent intermodal causeways of the medium when compared to other artistic disciplines. Now, unfortunately for you, this is an incredibly long and boring part of the presentation. So let's get started. In the beginning, all art was in black and white, but then color was invented and the world turned colorful. And then photography was invented and it turned back to black and white. And then color was invented, photo color was invented and it turned back to color. The end, the history of black and white. So how many of you would buy a three-legged dog or get on an airplane with only one wing or buy a car with no wheels? So why would you then take a perfectly good color image and strip it of all color? Why? It would be like driving a Model T in a Tesla world. It would be like using wet plates in a digital world. It would be like owning a three-legged dog, just somehow incomplete. I'd like to tell you about my journey to black and white, why it appeals to me, and why you might consider it. My story begins as a 14-year-old boy. I was living in Rochester, New York, and I went out for a hike one day when I stumbled across the ruins of an old home. My friend told me that it once was owned by George Eastman, the founder of Kodak and that piqued my interest. So I went to the school library, checked out his biography, and began to read. When I was reading about photography, I fell in love with it. I just became convinced that that photography was my destiny. I had never yet taken a picture. I had never been in a dark room to see that magic moment when a print comes up, but I was convinced that it was my destiny to be a photographer, and I still feel that way. For the next 10 years, my entire life was photography. I was out shooting every day. I was processing my work. And if I wasn't doing that, I was studying the work of the great masters. And as I looked at their work, I noticed that I was always drawn to a particular type of work. They were dark images. They were contrasty images. They were images that caused this physical shudder to go down my spine when I saw an image that I connected with. They were images that inspired me and images that made me want to create this type of look. This is my first fine art image created at age 14. So a lot of people ask me, but why black and white? You were born into a color world. And I tell them I wasn't. I was born into a black and white world. When I was a boy, television was all in black and white. Movies were in black and white. The news was delivered in black and white. My childhood heroes were in black and white. And even our nation was still segregated into black and white. So perhaps my images are a reflection of the world that I grew up in. The truth is I don't really know why I love black and white. But for me, color records the image, but black and white records the feelings that lie beneath the surface. Or put another way, color is a happy meal and black and white is fine dining. So what do I look for in a great black and white image? Well, I mentioned I love dark images. I love glowing subjects. I love detail enhanced by contrast. I love shapes, form, textures, patterns. My images are getting simpler, so I've fallen in love with a simple image. I love motion, which I also use to make an image more simple. I love motion with water, with sky, and even with people. This is the angel Gabriel. This is what I consider to be my most significant image. Why? Because it was the first time in my life that I actually created an image from my vision. I didn't just take a picture. I was photographing here at the Newport Beach Pier in Southern California, and it was a crowded day. Hundreds of people are walking past me. But because I was using a long exposure, the people disappeared 
except for those few who lingered just long enough to ghost. And the image was interesting, but it was lacking something. And so I began to look around for a subject when I saw this man eating French fries out of a trash can. I approached and asked if he would help me with an image that I would be happy to take him to lunch. He was reluctant, he, he was suspicious of me, but he agreed. He wanted to hold his Bible and this is the image that we used. Afterwards, we went to a four-star restaurant and Gabriel, this is his name actually, Gabriel, with bare feet, filthy matted hair, enters the restaurant, we get the looks. We sat and I invited Gabriel to order anything that he wanted. And he said that he had not had a steak with mushrooms and onions for years and ordered one. When the waitress brought it, he picked it up with his hands and ate it. Turns out that Gabriel had been a drug addict but was now recovered. He was a bit impaired from the experience. He, had, he was Romanian and I'm half Romanian. So we talked about Romania. Uh, I found out that his father lived nearby in San Dimas. And as we were parting ways, I said, Gabriel, give me your father's address. And if I sell any of these images, I'd be happy to send you a portion. He then responded, give it to someone who can really use it. I have everything that I need. And Gabriel walked away with his two possessions, a bedroll and his Bible. So how do you learn to photograph in black and white? Here's what I do. I put my camera into monochrome mode and raw mode. It's very important you do both. If it's in monochrome mode, I can see the image on the back of the camera in black and white. And that's very useful. But because it's in raw mode, it comes in as a color image in Photoshop. And I want it to be in color because I want to be the one to convert it to black and white. Learn how colors translate into different shades of gray because largely black and white for me is about contrast. And even more importantly, in that conversion process, learn to manipulate those different shades, colors into different shades of gray. Think in terms of shapes, contrast, and composition, because that's all you have with black and white. And so what, sh what subjects look great in black and white? I hear a lot of people think that there are certain subjects that, that should be reserved for color. And I actually think they all look great. All subjects look great in black and white, except for one. Color paint samples, those should be in color. So tonight I'd like to give you a Whitman sampling, just a little sampler of my work from each of my different portfolios and interspersed with some of the philosophies that I've come to believe in as a, a fine art photographer. Now let's talk just for a second about what a portfolio is. It's simply a group of images that are related or tell a story. For years, I resisted working in a portfolio I just like to go from photo to photo. Just I called myself a photographic grazer, and I didn't want to work on a single project. Well, a few years after that, I decided to submit my work to Lenswork, and the submission guidelines were pretty simple. Send 15 to 45 images on a single subject. Do not send us your greatest hits. Well, I was full of myself, and I said, well, he's not seen my greatest hits, and off they went. Well, I came back in just a couple of days with this big scrawled note that said, pick one image and send me 15 on that subject. And that was the kick in the rear that I needed to create my first portfolio. Because I had created some greatest hits or one hit wonders, but they were not connected. They were not related in any way. Grain silos was the very first project that I did. I live in northern Colorado and out here grain silos are at the center of every family farm and at the center of every small town. And so I spent three months just wandering the eastern plains photographing these grain bins. And I wanted to approach them a little differently than objects of utility. So I tried to look at them as objects of art. I started my career as a machinist and I was fascinated by the metal and the, how they gleaned in the sun. So that was my very first project that did appear in lens work. So I've heard you don't consider yourself a photographer. I don't. I think of myself as an artist who uses photography. Now that wasn't always the case. I would say for the first 35, 45 years, I thought of myself as a photographer. As a photographer, I almost worshiped my equipment. I was one of those people who always had the best equipment and had it first and had the most equipment. 
But as an artist, my God is the image and my camera is simply a tool. As a photographer, I saw my goal, it was to document what my eye saw. And I actually thought manipulation was a dirty word. But as an artist, my goal is to show you what I'm seeing in my head through my vision. There's nothing wrong with wanting to document, but I want to create. Melting giants. I drove to Nova Scotia, 9,000 mile trip, and spent several weeks there. And I just overheard two people talking while there. And one man said, if you want to see icebergs, go to Newfoundland. So the next year off I went. And I was a banner year for icebergs. And it turns out these icebergs start their lives or the end of their lives by breaking off a glacier in Greenland. And then they go counterclockwise taking nine to 12 months to come along the coast of Newfoundland where they finally kind of beach themselves, rock in the surf, break apart and finally die. And so I called this Melting Giants, this project, and I saw it as a very sad affair, I guess, because it was their last gaps of life. And these guys are giant. Let me give you an example of how big they are. This is just an iPhone shop, but if you look at the iceberg in the upper right corner, that is probably two or three times the size of an aircraft carrier. And then they break up till they get out there in the middle, or they just start rocking and then they break up into these 30,000 year old ice cubes on the shore. Ansel Adams was my childhood hero. I loved the look, I loved the images, and I tried to imitate him, not just the look. I actually went to Yosemite, tried to find where he stood and tried to recreate his exact images. Sounds silly now, but that's what I did as a boy. The greatest compliment I could receive was when someone said, your work reminds me of Ansel Adams. I beam with pride. Well, a few years later, I decided to go to review Santa Fe. That's where you spend an entire day going from table to table, showing your work to experts in the field. And I got to the last reviewer of the day. It was a long day. I was tired, he was tired. I showed him my work and he looked at it just for a few seconds and then brusquely pushed it back and said, it looks like you're trying to copy Ansel Adams. And I said, probably I am, I love Ansel Adams. And he then said something that would change my life forever. He said, Ansel already did Ansel. What can you do that exhibits your unique vision? That was like a fist to the face. Suddenly it became apparent to me, was my goal in life to be known as Cole Thompson, the world's greatest Ansel Adams imitator? Or did I have a vision and something to say? And so for the next two years, I set off trying to find my vision. Monoliths. On the Oregon coast, there's a town called Bandon, and it's got a two mile stretch of beach where these incredible monoliths just stick straight up from the sand. And I go every year to photograph these. And I've expanded my search to the entire Oregon coast. I go at different times of day, I go at different weather conditions, and most importantly, I go when my mood and my vision are different. So year after year, I see something new. And just love this ongoing project called Monoliths. So vision, what is it? I've been using that term. I have used that term used extensively. I kind of had a hint of what it is, but the truth is, I didn't really know. Is it a style that you develop? Is it a look or a technique? Is it a creative talent that you're born with? Is it something that some people have and others do not? And it turns out that it's none of those things. Vision is simply the sum total of our life experiences that allows us to see the world in a unique way. Think of it this way. Take everything that you've been taught believe, experienced, and put it into a blender and mix it up. And then take that mix and cast lenses that you then see the world through. And what you see through those life lenses is your vision. It's simply how you see the world. Vision is not learned and it's not developed, but rather vision is discovered and followed. And the most important thing I learned about vision 
is that we all have a vision. And I've talked to so many people who don't believe they have one, but everyone has one. In fact, you can't not have a vision. It's just how we see the world. So why is vision so important? I believe it's important because it's the difference between an average image and a great image. It's what makes your image yours. Isolated. A very simple project featuring an isolated tree. Perhaps with a bigger message, I never know. Another ongoing project. This is a favorite from the Bay of Fundy in New Brunswick. The Bay of Fundy is famous because it has the highest tides in the world, 55 feet. And when I arrived to take this picture, I heard about this Bay of Fundy and I wanted to photograph here. But when I got there, the tide was out. In fact, it was much further than this photo. And you could walk way out into the bay. And it turns out the, bay, the tide wasn't gonna be up until around midnight, so I waited all day. And I stood at the base of these stairs that went down to the, to the bottom of the bay. And as I'm photographing, it's so dark uh, that I had to do an eight minute exposure. And I was using my pen line to illuminate those side hills. So how did I find my vision? Well, I didn't even understand what vision was, so how could I find it? It was like this wisp of smoke that I just couldn't grasp. People used it, I'd, e I'd even used the phrase vision, but I didn't really understand exactly what it was. So I just came up with these 10 ideas, things that just made sense to me that I thought might help me find out if I had a vision. I wasn't certain of what I was doing. In fact, I was really just flying by the seat of my pants, but instinctively something told me that these 10 things would help me learn something about vision. The first thing I did, I separated my work into two piles. On the left, I put everything that I really, really loved, not liked, loved. And then the right, I put everything else. And on that right-hand pile, I had to put everything there, images that won contest, images that were popular, images that sold. Nothing could go on that right-hand pile, I mean, I'm sorry, the left-hand pile, unless I really, really loved it. I committed to, again, never again produce work that I didn't really love. I found that I was too easily swayed by other people's opinion and praise and accolades. And I found myself liking things that I really didn't like because they were popular. I practiced photographic celibacy. That is the practice of not looking at other photographers' work. And most people think I'm crazy because it's enjoyable. Everyone loves to look at great photography but I wanted to find my vision so bad that it was something I was willing to give up. I changed my mindset from photographer to artist. And this was important for me because I grew up in a poor home with no art, no music, no culture at all. We just scraped by. And so consequently, I grew up believing I had no creative ability or talent. And in order to find my vision, I had to believe it was possible that I had the potential of being creative. I stopped, this was the hardest. I stopped caring what other people thought of my work. As I looked around, I saw so many great photographers and so many great images. And uh, I, I would actually become discouraged. It took me two hard, gut-wrenching years to find my vision. But I finally did. And again, what I learned, the most important thing was that it was there all along and that everyone has one. So I'd like to show you some before and after images to, just to give you an idea of the difference between what my eye sees and what the vision is seeing. This is the angel Gabriel, the before and after. And as I mentioned, this is the most important image to me because it was the first time that I had stood there and I knew what the image was gonna look like. In the past, I had taken a picture, gone home and played with it, hoping to stumble onto something great. But I learned with vision, it became a roadmap. This is skeleton. I found this skeleton, this pile of bones laying exactly as is along the Poudre River in my town of Fort Collins. And as I looked down at that original scene, even though we had the, the low contrast, the bright leaves, the bright bones, I knew what that final image would look like. And I don't always know how I'm going to do it, but I figure it out. This is a fairly recent image, the Jim Bridger power plant shot along I-80 in Wyoming. And that's the, it was a daytime, bright daytime shot. 
The nice thing about having a vision is, is that it takes all the guesswork out of it. Once you have the image of what you want, figuring out how to do it is pretty easy. This is Windmill and Moonlight shot on a very cold evening in Nebraska. And because of the bright moon on the, the uh, snowy ground, it was a very difficult exposure. So I just simply, I knew what I wanted, so I just took one shot for the sky and one shot for the foreground. So a lot of people say, after seeing your before and after images, I realized that I need to learn a lot more about Photoshop. And that is exactly not my point. Some people believe you need great technical skills before you can express your vision. I hear that all the time. I need to have the tools mastered in my toolbox before I can express my vision. Boy, I can't tell you how much I disagree with that. I say find your vision and then learn the skills necessary to execute it. When I created this image from the ghost of Auschwitz-Birkenau, I did not know how to create ghosts or create this look, but I knew what I wanted as I stood there photographing. I knew what it would look like in my head. And then the only challenge, which is a relatively easy one, is the technical part. The hard part's the vision. There's the before and after. Here's one from Bandon Beach in Oregon. And it's sometimes, you know, the technical part isn't all that difficult. Sometimes it's simply like burning out the distracting elements or bringing out details that you know are there. Here's one, a recent one from Idaho, uh, from my Powerline series. It's nice to have the roadmap. It's really comforting because I know what I'm doing then when I process the image. And last, I think we've got here the cloud image. This was taken a mile from my home. And another thing I love about black and white is that things like atmospheric haze and things are no problem in black and white. You can create these dramatic images from fairly weak images that the eye saw. The Road to Nowhere. I was in Death Valley shooting a how-to video and they were documenting as we drove, we were talking, driving, and I saw this image and so we documented the seeing of it, the discussing of what I was going to look like, my vision, the photograph, and then the post-processing. And that led to a, a series called The Road to Nowhere from the Faroe Islands, and another from the Faroe Islands, and from Death Valley. So my processing is very simple. In fact, I would say it's extremely simple. I typically use just six tools in Photoshop. The, I'm going to run through these as a demonstration. I convert them. I convert them to black and white. I adjust my levels to ensure I have a true black and a true white. I dodge and burn just like I did in the darkroom. I pump the contrast so it will print well. And then I clone the spots. So let's go through one. Oh, if you want to see a video of me processing one, just go to my website and go to the blog and search for Photoshop and six tools. And I run through this in a video. So the first thing I do is I come into the raw converter and I just play with these little sliders until I get the image basically how I like it. Then, by using the black and white conversion tool, I can use these color sliders to actually apply a filter after the fact. And I'll, with a lot of my work, it's the red and the yellow sliders that I'm using the most of. And I just, again, play with it until it has the look I want. Then I adjust my levels. And as you can see, this image, even though it may look like it has a true black, it does not. And it may look like it has a true white, but it does not. And so I just move those sliders in to make sure that I do have one. That's really one of the keys to having a great black and white image, at least my type of image, a good black, a good white. And then I dodge and burn, just like I did in the darkroom days. I have a Wacom tablet with a pen, which is essential. You really can't do it well with a mouse for a lot of reasons. And then I remove the spots because I never clean my sensor. Add some contrast so it will print well. And there's the final image with the before and after. Now my vision sees this in black and white. Yours might see it in color. Popular photography called me the Photoshop heretic because they said I did everything wrong. But it helped me to appreciate there is no right or wrong in Photoshop. The only thing that matters is the results, the image. 
I used to be so embarrassed about my very simple processing that I would never let somebody watch me process because I would hear people with these elaborate processes with all these tools and masks. And, and I thought, wow, I'm a simpleton, but it doesn't matter. Photoshop works best if you use it the way you're good at and the way you're comfortable at. And I'd like to share my secret of post-processing and it is knowing what you want to do, not knowing how to do it. Any monkey can learn certain t technical tasks, but to have that vision, to know what you want, that's the real key to a wonderful image. Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge, and I agree. Trees from a train. I lived in Alaska in the 1970s, and last October, I get a call from a friend, Jim Norman. He's kind of up your way. And he said, I've got one of those two for one airplane tickets. Would you like to go to Alaska with me? And I jumped at the chance because I hadn't been back since 1975. And the one thing that I knew I wanted to do in Alaska was to ride the train from Fairbanks to Anchorage. It's a 12 hour train ride. And I love trains anyway. So you get on this train and it was almost empty. It was wonderful. And as you're shooting outside the window, you realize, wow, this is going to be 12 hours, but what am I going to shoot? Everything's whizzing by. There's no time to compose. Even if you see this great mountain scene off in the distance, all of a sudden a bunch of trees pass by the window and block your view. So what I did is I went between two cars, opened both doors on each side, and I began shooting outside the, the car. And I started photographing the trees. Well, the first instinct is to pan with the trees. But then I started thinking, what would happen if I used a long exposure and panned at the same time. And so I started to try it. And this something wonderful was happening that I wasn't exactly sure was happening. I was getting this incredible distortion and swirling, yet the one tree I was focused on remained fairly static. So for the next 12 hours, I just played with this and had a wonderful time naming the project Trees from a Train. And in retrospect, I've learned that the key to this look was the focal plane shutter the type of shutter that most of us have in our digital SLRs. That was a wonderful project, and it was wonderful being back in Alaska, and I was happy to come home with something. And this was in the most recent issue of Lenswork. So when you go to a new location, how do you prepare? I don't. I literally don't. I do two things. I purchase airline tickets, I rent a car, and that's it. I do not look at guidebooks to see the wonderful sights in the new land. I do not look at other photographers' work. I literally do nothing. I don't book hotels because I don't want to be locked into a certain location. I want to go where my eye takes me. And that's what I did when I went to Iceland for three weeks. I just traveled. Did I miss some of the iconic sights? Thank God I did, because those have been shot by a million people a billion times before. But I hope I saw some of my own iconic shots. Now, ironically, as I traveled, I did accidentally shoot an iconic shot. But that's okay. I didn't know it, and I hopefully put my twist on it. It was a wonderful trip. When I was there, I happened to be there during the worst storm of the century. The winds hit 137 miles per hour. When I stopped here at that lagoon where the icebergs are, I could barely get my car door open to take this one shot. And as I traveled, and those winds hit my car, I was in fear of the car turning over. All my windows burst out and it stripped the car of paint and just almost totally destroyed the automobile. While I was driving, I would follow the, the lines in the road and I would travel maybe five miles per hour. But then at times the, the lines disappeared and I was flying blind and it turns out that the top layer of asphalt was blowing away. Ancient stones. This is simply a project of ancient stones. In my mind, these stones are almost alive and they've been standing there for centuries, just watching us humans scurrying about full of self-importance. And they're primarily done in the Alabama Hills and in Joshua Tree. Do you dance? This is a story I heard on the radio. 
about an emergency room physician working on the Navajo Indian Reservation. He was working a Saturday when an old man walks in with this long gray braided hair and he just stood there. So he grabbed, the physician grabbed his clipboard, walks over to him and said, can I help you? And the old man just stared off into the distance, never acknowledging him. And he said, just a little perturbed, look, I can't help you if you won't talk to me. And he turned to the physician and said, do you dance? And the physician paused and thought about that for a moment. He wondered, could this perhaps be a medicine man who believes in healing through dance and song? And so he said, no, I don't. Can you teach me? And the old man said, I can teach you to dance, but you must hear the music. And I've thought about this in two ways I've thought about this. First, a couple of years ago, my wife decided that our marriage needed a little spicing up and that we were going to start going out and go dancing. So she signed us up for dance lessons. And it was interesting how my wife learned to dance and how I learned. I learned by memorizing the steps and counting out loud. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. My wife closed her eyes, listened and felt the music and flowed with it. I remember the first time we went out dancing for real. And she said to me, are you gonna count all nights? I learned so much different than my wife. And I wonder, isn't that similar to how some of us, myself included, learned photography? We can learn the technology of photography with our mind. We can learn about f-stops and depth of fields and all of these wonderful tools. But if we're not hearing the music, we're simply technical photographers who are documenting scenes. Harbinger. I was on a father and son outing with my 12 year old old son, Jim. We were on I-70 coming out of Grand Junction, Colorado, entering Utah. When I saw these great mud hills, and it was about 103. And so my son is complaining the entire time that we're stopping and going out in the heat. And I'm photographing these mud hills and they were interesting. And it was very similar to the Angel Gabriel. The scene was interesting, but it lacked a subject. And my son was complaining, can we go? How much longer? You said 10 minutes, 10 minutes ago. And I finally got so exasperated, I just said, fine, we're going back to the car. But we got almost back to the truck and I noticed there was this single cloud traveling low across the top of the hills. And it was moving into position. And in just a minute, it would be right over that spot that I had been photographing. So I said, we're going back. And we ran back up the hill I got my tripod out, I got my gear out, I got one shot, and I called it the first word that came to mind, harbinger, an omen of things to come. And people would ask, Cole, are you gonna do a project on these harbingers? And I would just laugh because I thought, what are the chances? But as I have looked for them, I have seen more and more harbingers over Mount McKinley, over a, a dry grass field in Nebraska, over Devil's Tower in Wyoming, Tongariki on Easter Island. And the more I look for them, the more I see them. A recent one from Arizona and another from Arizona. So this is a favorite project of mine. And it's one I, I have a feeling will last my entire life, that the more you look, the more you see. So how important is equipment when creating an image? Well, not nearly as important as we think not nearly as important as your vision. A story. A famous photographer was invited to dinner by a wealthy New York socialite. She greeted him warmly at the door and said, I love your work. You must have a wonderful camera. He said nothing. At the end of the meal, he thanked her and said, that was delicious. You must have a wonderful stove. I hope you're smiling because we all know a great stove does not a great meal make. Yet sometimes we act as though our equipment is the key to a great image. If only I had this lens, or I had a prime, or I could shoot at this magical f-stop, or whatever it is. If I had to choose between the world's best equipment and no vision, or a Kodak brownie and I could keep my vision, I'll take the brownie because I know even with a brownie, I can create images that I love and are meaningful to me. When I was in St. Petersburg, Russia, I spent all afternoon photographing this row of trees at the Winter Palace. And when I got home, none of the images were good. 
and I was disappointed because I invested a lot of time. Then I remembered that I had taken a single iPhone shot. And that's where this image came from. This highly cropped eight megapixel iPhone shot. Equipment is not nearly as important as we think it is. Ukrainians with eyes shut. My son was serving in the Peace Corps in Ukraine and we went to visit him. And as is my practice, I did no preparation. I hoped that I would see something that would create a passion and I would find a project. Well, when I was there, I'm, I'm burning through days, not seeing anything and I'm getting concerned. And of course, the fewer days you have, the more concerned you become. And it, it was just getting crazy because I was getting scared that I would come home empty handed. The people were interesting, but there's always a problem, at least I have, photographing people in a foreign land. They put on the camera face, that big smile, and you don't really get to see the real person. And I don't have a common language to break down the barrier, and I certainly don't have the time to get to know the person. So as I was pondering this problem, we were standing at a bus stop, and I saw a man standing against a wall, and using sign language, I approached him and I said, America, he nodded. I held up my camera, photographer, he nodded. I did the universal symbol, can I take your picture? He nodded. I took it. Then, using sign language, I said, stop, close your eyes. And he questioned, close my eyes. I said, yes, with my hands, close your eyes. And I took the shot. And I started photographing these Ukrainians with their eyes closed. And I found not only did it get rid of the camera face, it helped me see more of the real person. They let down their defenses just a little bit. When I was in Lviv photographing, this little man, five foot nothing, shuffles up to me and in very broken Italian English asks what we're doing. And we explain. And he just said nothing and shuffled away. A few minutes later, he shuffles back with his camera and he said, can I take your picture? And I said, sure. And he said, with your eyes closed. And he took my picture and sent it to me. And when I closed my eyes, I realized how trusting these people have been because your first thought is, is this a scam? Is this a joke? What's, what's going to happen? So I was very appreciative of how trusting the Ukrainians were. Simplify. A few years ago, I noticed I was spending a lot of time with technical issues. You'd upgrade your OS, then programs would stop working. Then you needed new drivers. You'd upgrade firmware, then things quit working. And there was new plugins that wouldn't work with old programs. And it was just getting ridiculous. So I decided to simplify my life. I reduced my equipment. Everything I own now is in a single bag. I got rid of all the gadgets and I simplified my processes to my Photoshop in six steps. What was the result? Well, I spent less time tinkering, installing, adjusting, updating, and fixing. I focused more on the creative process, which was what I was trying to do. And something unexpected happened. My images started getting simpler. And that's a trend I've enjoyed and continue to follow. The Lone Man. I was photographing in Southern California in San Diego at the children's pool. And I was waiting for a group of people to leave and they were lingering. So I was getting a little impatient. I thought, well, I'll, I'll do a test shot and at least get the exposure already for when they leave. And I did a 30 second and I noticed something. Most of the people disappeared because they were moving except for that one gentleman. And then I noticed that body attitude that there was something familiar with how he stood so still for those 30 seconds. And I realized I'd seen it before. When people stand on the edge of the world, as I call it, they become very penseful, pensive and thoughtful. They think about things greater than self. They wonder about how big the world is and how small they are. They wonder if they matter if their lives make a difference. And so I called this project The Lone Man. And this lone man coming up is a special one to me because that's actually my daughter-in-law. That's in the Faroe Islands. And I'm on an equally high cliff, literally on the edge, just scared to death because I hate heights. But I was even more concerned because on the other side was my daughter-in-law, my son with their baby on their back. And this is, a, this is like a 10 mile drop. It's the biggest cliff I've ever seen in my life. I hear a lot of people engage in these esoteric discussions. 
what is art, what is fine art, and I thought I would weigh in with my opinion. Who cares? I only ask myself two questions. Do I like it and would it look good on my wall? To me, it's that simple. I had a neighbor who approached and asked if I would take her yearbook photo. And I don't do that kind of thing. It's not my thing. But she said, I want something unique. And that piqued my interest. And so this is the image I created for her yearbook photo. And I happened to show it to a friend with an MFA. And he said to me, well, you know, Cole, this really isn't a fine art image. And I said, well, Russ, I never said that it was. But tell me why. I was expecting there, there to be a cow rule. And he said, because everyone knows that in a fine art image, the subject never smiles. And I thought, how silly. Create what you love, no matter what it's called or what others think. Sometimes others may not understand or like your work, and that's okay. It's not for them, or at least it shouldn't be. Self-shadows. Here's a project, a perfect example. It will never be published. It will never win a contest. I bet I'll never sell one, but I love doing it. Everywhere I go, I create a self-shadow or a shadow selfie. And they're meaningful to me. This is the most recent one from Death Valley. Alabama Hills. And they bring back wonderful memories for me. Tongariki. And this one I call, I'm on the left. Don't compare your work to others. I used to spend hours looking at other photographers' work on the internet. And I noticed that there were millions of great photographers, and all, all their work seemed to be better than mine. And I became very discouraged. All I could see was their strengths and my weaknesses, and that was an unfair comparison. One of the keys to finding your vision is learning to ignore what others are doing. Art is not a race, it's not a contest. I could hear my mother's voice in my head. What other people are doing is none of your business. You just worry about coal. It was good advice. Moy at the quarry. When I was 17, I read the book Aku Aku by Thor Heyerdahl. Actually, I read three of his books. I loved Thor. I loved the adventures he went on, but Easter Island really had a place in my heart. And I guess I always wanted to go, but it seems so impossible. It's known as the most isolated place on earth. Well, a few years back, my wife and I are creating our bucket list. And I just made an offhand comment. Well, I'd love to go to Easter Island, but of course that's impossible. And my wife said, why? And I couldn't come up with a reason why. So off we went. And while there, I created three portfolios. This is the first of them. This, there's about a thousand moi on Easter Island, and most of them are still in an unfinished state at the quarry. They would carve them out of the rock, dig a hole, slide them down the hill, plop them in the hole so that it was convenient to work on their heads. Well, at some point in time, they literally dropped their tools and walked away, seemingly in a day. A lot of people think the great mystery of Easter Island is how they transported them. I don't think that's the mystery. That's a technical issue. To me, the mystery is, why did they drop their tools and walk away? So this portfolio is simply the quarry where these moi were created. So how do I pick a subject? Well, for the longest time, I would keep a piece of paper in my breast pocket, and I would write down every idea that I had. And I got up to about 50 ideas when it suddenly occurred to me I had never once used one of those ideas. Every project that I had done had simply grabbed me. So I don't pick projects, they pick me. Let me tell you about one, ceiling lamps. My mother lived in Akron, Ohio, and I went to visit her. And I was checking out in the lobby, and I just happened to look up and saw a ceiling lamp in the lobby ceiling. And it just, for whatever reason that day, caught my attention. So I pushed the coffee table out of the way, laid that on the floor, and just looked at that lamp, and then began photographing it. That's this lamp. And it just really hit me, I don't know why, and I started photographing all the lamps that I found this way. And I created this project called Ceiling Lamps. These lamps weren't photographed as objects of utility or objects of beauty, but just straight from below. And I started grouping them together, like this one in the upper right, that's from my favorite Del Taco in Costa Mesa. 
I, I, I almost recognize every one of these lamps and where they were taking, and it was just great fun. And then here recently, I went to Moscow and found these great beauties in the subway. Great Soviet art. So why do I create? Well, I know why I created as that 14-year-old boy, just the pure joy of creating to please myself. But then I started using it to get positive feedback from my family and then friends. Then I said, I have to win contests to validate that these are good images. They're not good unless they win, right? Then I said, I need to have a resume because no one will take me serious without my resume. Then I wanted to be famous. I, I equated being a photographer with being a rock star, I guess. Then I started arguing that I needed to make money. This, this hobby needed to pay for itself. And then some 50 years later, I've come full circle to right where I began as a 14 year old boy and have learned to create to just please myself. I do my best work when I ignore what others think and create images that I love. The Fountainhead. Another great book I read at age 17 was The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. And it's interesting because it's about an architect who goes against what everyone else is doing. They're living in a neoclassical world, and he's creating modern architecture. And he's shunned for it, criticized for it. He's banned from creating, taking new jobs, but he doesn't care. He has this vision of what he loves, and despite what everyone else is doing, he goes forward. Well, I'm one day in stop-and-go traffic in San Diego, and in front of me is a minivan with this dark tinted curved window. And in its reflection, I could see the skyscraper behind me, and it was all distorted, and I loved the look. I go home and I tell my wife about it, and I say, what can I do to create this look? And she had this idea of taking a funhouse mirror, a ferrotype plate that I could flex to create these images. And because it would include me in the image, I would have to lay on the ground so I wasn't in the reflection. So I went from city to city all over the West and Midwest photographing these buildings. This is one of my favorites from Portland. It was a project just, uh, again, just grabbed me. So what photographic rules should you follow? None, unless you want to create average images that look like everyone else's. Do you remember paint by numbers? We were promised that if we followed the rules, and they were simple enough, use the right color and the right number and stay within the lines, we would create a masterpiece. Well, maybe not a masterpiece, but a competent image. You don't create a masterpiece by following the numbers or by following the rules. At best, all you will produce is an imitation. The so-called rules of composition are, in my opinion, invalid, irrelevant, immaterial. Ansel Adams. Who can argue with Ansel? There are no need for rules when you have found your vision from an ex-Ansel Adams imitator. The Dunes of Nude. I go every January to Death Valley. And my favorite spot is the Mesquite Dunes. I don't go to the big dunes where everybody's trampling them. And I go to the little dunes. I photograph these smaller dunes in a much more intimate way. And as I photograph them, I'm always thinking that these are like portions of the nude body. So I call the project the Dunes of Nude. And I'm able to go for about 90 minutes in the morning and 90 minutes in the evening when the sun is very low. And I've gone every year for about 15 years now, and I'll continue because it's one of my favorite places. And like Bandon, Every year, my images look different because my vision is a little different. My mood is a little different. So to create great images, you must go to exotic locations. Not. I think it's very unfair for us speakers who always come away with these great locations we've been with. And the message we're subtly suggesting is, a great image comes from a great location, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Great images are found wherever you can see them. And what I'd like to show you is just images that I've created within 15 minutes of my home. Skeleton, wiggles roaring, old car interior, wrenches, 
flaming dahlia, railroad tracks, clouds, windsurfing, plate of leaves, two trees in lifting fog, Poudre River spillway, four silos, uh, forgot the title, fluid water, uh, storms underbelly, ceiling lamp, morning dove ranch. Those were all created within 15 minutes of my home. So please forgive us for giving the false impression that you have to go to a great location. All locations are great. Edward Weston, when he was confined to a chair later in life said, I should be able to look at my feet and see a great image. Moist standing is the second project I created in Easter Island. There are seven ahus or these uh, platforms on Easter Island that still have standing moi. All the rest have been toppled, presumably through war. And so it's a very small project. And interestingly, all of these ahus have the moi facing in towards the island, not outward. And I don't know why, but I find most people, myself included, thought they would be facing outward. Only one ahu, this one, has them facing out towards the ocean. Nobody knows why. So a very small project. Now, interesting, when you go to these ahus, all the, the dogs run wild there. They're, I think they are not owned by anybody, they're just wild dogs. And what's interesting is I always judge people by their animals. If you go to Moscow, you don't pet the dogs because you will get bit and you will get rabies shots. My son can attest to that. In Easter Island, the dogs are so incredibly gentle. And this one dog, we called him Graybeard, would hang around this one ahu and we would feed him every day. And he was so mangy and so in poor health. So every time somebody would go to Easter Island, I would ask them to stop and see Graybeard and report back how he's doing. But just gentle dogs. I was showing that one portfolio, exhibiting the ancient stone portfolio, when a girl walks up to me, looks at an image and says, you know, that image doesn't follow the rule of thirds and you should never put your horizon on the center line. And I was astounded that she could not see the image. She could only see rules not followed. And so I kind of jokingly created my own rule of thirds, which states a great image consists of one third vision, one third the shot, and one third processing. But it's the vision that is driving the shot and driving the processing. Technical perfection without vision will result in a technically perfect but soulless image. Linny, a portrait of breast cancer. Linny had purchased a copy of the Angel Gabriel for me, from me. And about a year later, she calls me up and says, I've got breast cancer, I've had a mastectomy, I'd like you to photograph me. Well, I said, Lenny, I really don't do that type of photography. She goes, that's okay, I want you to do it. I said, well, Lenny, let me give you the name of a woman I know who specializes in this. No, I want you to do it. And no matter what excuse I came up with, the wrong equipment, no experience with lighting, she wouldn't let go. She wanted me to do it, so off I went. It was an uncomfortable shoot for me, and I can't imagine how uncomfortable it was for Lenny. But she was insistent that she believed these images would do other women good. And all through the photographic shoot, I had this one question that I wanted to ask, but I dared not for fear for ruining the mood. So as we neared the end of the day, I finally got the courage to ask Lenny my question. Lenny, what is your prognosis? And she replied, I'll be dead by Christmas. Now, the good news is that was about 10, 12 years ago, and Lenny is still alive and has a full head of hair. And Lenny is now calling me, asking me to photograph her up once again, and I doubt I'll be able to get out of it. I don't know if you guys experience this, but I have. People are always telling me what I should do with my images. Sometimes they just come out right and say, look, here's what you should do. Other times they're a little more polite and say, well, if it were my image, I would. Don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. 
when I created the angel Gabriel, the first time I had used my vision, I was so proud of it. I showed a mentor I had at the time and she said, don't center the image. You're always doing that Cole. And I'm always telling you, don't center the image. And I was conflicted because that's how I saw it. But here's a woman who is a curator, who is a, a teacher of photography at a local college, who is a known artist. I should respect her opinion, right? So I went home and played with it and it just didn't feel right. In fact, it physically made me ill. This is how I saw that image and someone else may do it like this, but this is how I saw it and that is how it is meant to be. And I made a commitment at that moment to never again listen to another person's advice on my vision. There are no experts when it comes to your vision. You are the expert. Another story. A photographer was exhibiting his work for the very first time. A well-known art critic was in attendance. He approached the photographer and said, would you like to hear my opinion about your work? Sure, said the photographer. He said, it's worthless. The photographer responded, I know, but let's hear it anyway. There are no experts when it comes to your vision. And in, even more importantly, don't say to someone else, what should I do with this image? People ask me that all the time. And I tell them, look, if I were to tell you what you should do to that image and you followed my advice, soon your images would begin to look like mine. Confucius say, they who walk in another's footsteps never finds their own path. When someone asks me what they should do with their image, here's what I think. You don't know, do you? Find your vision. Moy, sitting for portrait. This is the third project that came from Easter Island. Getting to Easter Island is not for the faint of wallet. It's kind of a long trip. I went from Denver, way over here, up to Toronto, way down to Santiago, and then way out to Easter Island. It was one heck of a long flight from Toronto to Santiago. And I slept and dreamt, here is the dream that I had, that the Moy were actually alive. And I had taken two stands and a giant roll of paper, and I was going to go invite the Moy to sit for a portrait. And I started to approach them. And they had various reasons why they didn't want to do it. They were distrustful of outsiders. They were too old. They were infirm. They didn't want to run into so-and-so they had a dispute with. And so I was really uncertain if anyone would show up. So the day comes and I'm waiting and nobody shows. And then slowly, some of the younger ones start to come and I start to photograph them. And the word gets out and more and more come. I woke up from this dream, told my wife and said, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I created this series called Moy, Sitting for Portrait. And of course, I photographed them in the wild, put them in a digital backdrop that made it look like they had sat for a portrait. Here's what it, one of the before and after images. Just let go. Letting go was one of the biggest keys to finding my vision. I mentioned earlier that we all have a vision, even if you don't think you do. But what happens is it's buried under all these things that block it. it in fact, it, it blocks it for so long and so well that we come away believing we never had a vision. Letting go of what others thought of my work. Letting go of conforming to what everybody else in the club is doing. Letting go of following the rules. Worrying if others would like my work. Letting go of trying to win contests, of getting likes, Letting go of photographing the right way, whatever that is. Letting go of trying to please others. Letting go of other people's expectations. Letting go of the fear of criticism. Really just letting go of everything. And once I did that, I was free because I didn't care. And that really is the biggest key to finding your vision, not caring. Free to create whatever I wanted Vision is what's left over when you remove all of those fears and insecurities, when you stop complying and conforming, when you ignore what others are doing and you pursue what you love, that is what your vision is. The Faroe Islands. 
I don't know if any of you have watched the TV show Shetland. I just fell in love with it. And as I looked at the background, I fell in love with the Shetland Islands. And I said, I want to go there. So I got on Google Maps to see where it was at. And as I was looking at it, I said, wait a minute, what's these Faroe Islands? And boy, they look even more isolated and even more interesting. So off I went. And as is my practice, no research, no anything. And I spent a month there. The Faroe Islands consist of about 17 islands, as I recall, many connected with these great undersea tunnels. And it's a beautiful land. All oh, the weather from the south to the north is incredibly different. Uh, it's wild. You could close your eyes, open them, and imagine you were in the 1700s. There's more sheep than people. Uh, the precipices, the, 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 it's unbelievable what you can see there. And even though it looks very black and white and gloomy, I want to show you what it looks like, how I was photographing it. Bright blue skies and just beautiful weather. Uh, it was stormy at times, but it was just a beautiful place. This shot was interesting because I had gone out to one of the ends of the island, walk, drove out to the end of the road, and then was walking about two miles further. I'm in the middle of nowhere, but I see two people walking towards me right here. And I notice one's carrying a tripod. So as we get closer, I said hi. And the person responds, hi, Cole. And he had, I guess, seen on my blog I was going to the Faroe Islands and figured with so few people, it was a pretty good chance it was me, and he was right. So how long do projects take? Well, I used to think they took years or they weren't very good. In fact, the longer they took, the better they were. But the truth is they really just take as long as they take. I'd like to show you a project that I completed in under two hours. When I was in Ukraine with my son, we decided to go next door to Poland and we stayed in Krakow. And I knew that Auschwitz-Birkenau was nearby, but I didn't want to go. But as the family discussed what we were going to do, they came to a vote that we were going to go see the death camps. I had not intended to photograph. I thought that would somehow be sacrilegious or at least insensitive. But I had my gear with me and the tour bus wouldn't let me leave it on the bus. He was insistent that he not be responsible, so I carried it. As we entered, began the tour, the first thing you see is this book documenting each person. A beautiful black and white photograph, really a masterful photograph. And then in beautiful penmanship, I don't know what language, they documented the person. And your, your, your head's starting to swirl. Why are they taking such great care to provide beautiful documentation of a person they're about to kill, work to death or kill? Then we went into the room with those iconic piles, a pile of human hair, a pile of glasses, a pile of bridge work yanked from the mouths of the dead. And I'm not claustrophobic, but I could not breathe. And I signaled to my family to continue without me that I was going outdoors. And outdoors, I was catching my breath and I was walking, just staring at my feet. And I remember thinking, who else walked in this very same path on their way to the gallows? Who else took these very same steps on the way to the gas chamber? I began to wonder, just metaphorically, if the spirits of those who lived and died at Auschwitz-Birkenau still lingered there. And then suddenly I just had this idea that I needed to photograph the ghosts of those people who had lived and died at Auschwitz-Birkenau. So I just started photographing the other visitors at the camp using long exposures to turn them into ghosts. Now part of the challenge was I knew what I wanted, but the people there are so polite that once you set up your tripod and camera, the people would move out of the way. So I had to very quickly develop a technique. I would turn my back to the camera using a remote shutter. I would talk very loudly on my cell phone like one of those loud Americans until people would gather back in the area and then using the remote shutter get the shot. I had 45 minutes at Auschwitz and then the bus left to Birkenau where I had an hour. And so this project was created in an hour and 45 minutes. But it was a project that I didn't choose, it chose me and the gas chamber. I've been fortunate to exhibit this work at many Holocaust museums and at one, the Dallas Holocaust Museum, 
I saw this woman being pushed around in a wheelchair by a nurse, and she was looking at the images. I went and introduced myself, saying, hi, I'm Cole. These are my images. And I remember that bony finger as she pointed to them and said, these are my images. Edith had been in turn and had survived Auschwitz-Birkenau. And it just you know, it boggles the mind what it must have been like to look at those images. I got to exhibit this work and speak at the Simon Wiesenthal Center on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And there met and heard stories from over 100 survivors, and it was a real honor. Final tip, what's the easiest way to make money from fine art photography? Sell your equipment. I never worked as a fine art photographer or a photographer. I always chose to keep this as a passion. I was wise enough to know that there was not a lot of money in it. And more importantly, I didn't want it to become a job. I wanted it to remain my passion. And I have never regretted that decision. So summary, three dogs are awesome. Three-legged dogs are awesome. And so is black and white. The real key is your vision. Forget the rules. Don't follow other people's advice. Learn to let go. Keep things simple and listen to the music. And that concludes my presentation. So I am going to start my video and turn everything back over to Sandy. Tell me that everybody can hear me for the entire yes. time. Yes, hi, I'm here. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Cole. Um, okay. Do we have, do you have time for a few questions? I'm hoping that there will be. I, oh, good. I, I don't know why these Zooms are not conducive to questions, but I hope that people will. Yeah, so we do not have any questions in the chat room yet. It's all about, um, you know, how wonderful, thank you so much, terrific, great presentation, it just bravo, it just goes on and on. But no questions. Um, well, I would hope somebody had, I don't know if people are shy or what, but I'd sure love a couple. There, there's yeah. a question. There is a question. Good. There's a question. Oh, the focal, focal plane shutter. That's yeah, there's a question called. above that. That it is called the focal plane shutter. <laughs> it is a curtain, basically, that goes across your film plane. And it just, if you have a fast, uh, say a 500th, it's a very narrow slit. And if it's a second, it's a bigger slit. And that's how SLRs create the different exposures. So all, if you have an SLR, it most likely has a focal plane shutter. Mm. Paul, uh, this is Tom Anderson. How how much experimentation do you do when you're pursuing uh, a vision of a of a particular shot? You say yeah. experimentation. Yeah, experimentation. Uh, how much mm. variation of technique do you use? I mean, it it well, takes a while to develop a vision. It's just a, it's just not there at the beginning. There's something that builds to it. I like take trees for a train, the image behind me. Uh, initially, I just started doing one thing, but then I tried varying it, uh, varying the distance of the trees, uh, varying the angle the camera was at. So I guess I really am just, you know, naturally curious and trying to not have all the images look the same, trying to get a little variation for the portfolio. So uh, there is certainly experimentation just to not have, say, 20 images all looking exactly the same. Hey, Cole. Yes. Um, I just want to know how many people have um, actually given up photography after seeing your presentation? <laughs> well, I really hope the opposite is true. I hope everybody really does have this spark of belief. If you're one of those people who say, I'm not creative, I don't have a vision, that you have this spark of belief that it's possible that I might. I was the most uncreative person in the world. I was strictly a technical photographer because I believed that I could compensate for my creativity by excelling in the technical. Now that's ridiculous, I see that now, but that's what I believe. I don't have creative ability, let's at least exploit the technical create, you know, ability. No, it's, 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 I'm totally inspired, again. Do you question. have, oh, sorry. Yeah, my name is J.C. Williams. Uh, Cole, are any of your photographs composites or are they all single photos? 
Uh, let me think about that. I don't think I have any composites. I do, uh, it depends what you call a composite. If you remember that windmill in Moonlight where I had the bright moon with the snow covered ground, it was so bright that I did take the top half with one exposure and the bottom half with another. But I don't think that's what, probably what you mean, is it? No, that's not what I mean. You answered my question then, right? Yeah, I had somebody accuse me of placing my clouds in my image and told me that he had done a, an analysis and that the shadow on the cloud was different than the shadow on the hill on that very first harbinger. And so I sent him the raw image. Those are all as you see them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, my name's right. Eve. Do you have any rituals for or ways you access your vision, like prayer, meditation, walking around backwards, you know, whatever it might be? That's a good question. Uh, I have another presentation called How I Found My Vision. And one of the things that I do is I found things that are inspirational to me. Uh, things that are inspirational to me are reading the day books by Edward Weston, uh, his journal of his time in Mexico. He's one of my philosophical heroes. And uh, that inspires me. Listening to the Beatles inspire me because it reminds me, uh, if you look at their early album, they could have just continue to do the same thing. And I'm sure there were experts at EMI who said, don't change a thing. This is a winning formula. But every album, they changed and changed and changed because they didn't want to just be the best. They wanted to be creative. So when I look at their body of work and how they were always reinventing themselves, I say, how can I apply that to me? I don't want to be the same kind of photographer that I was in 2000 that I am in 2020. So I hope everyone will find something that inspires them. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I am going to give the angel Gabriel away and how we're going to do it. This has never worked. I'll tell you right now. Whose birthday is it? I have a question. Oh, somebody has a question. Can we get one last one in? You bet, Larry. OK. Do you recommend shooting in color first, then converting to black and white, or did you yes. shoot the original in black Never and white? Never shoot in black and white, because I don't want either Canon or photo, Adobe deciding how to interpret that black and white from the color image. I want to make that decision. So I always shoot in raw, so my images come in color, and then I convert it. How about <laughs> shooting in JPEG? Never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Never, because I do a lot of burning, and that means I'm doing a very great, my skies are graduated with eight bits, JPEG, that gets banding. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you shoot in, if I shoot in monochrome on JPEG, the image will come in in monochrome, it won't be in color. The only way to get the best of both worlds is to shoot in monochrome mode and raw mode. Okay, thank you. So does anybody have a birthday today so I can give away the Angel Gabriel? No. Oh. No. Okay, Mine yesterday? <laughs> tomorrow. Mine was the 6th. July 20th. Anybody can beat the 6th? Can we lie? Me, Gary Faulkner. What's your birthday, Gary? July 6th. Anybody can beat that closer to today? Can we lie? July 20th. Not <laughs> <laughs> about November 9th. Who's Gary? July. October 3rd. How about November. November 9th. Who was that, Gary? Somebody said July 20th or something. We can't yeah. lie, huh? Mm. That's like I said Gary October better. 3rd. July 6th, wasn't it? Yes. July 6th for Gary. Okay, Gary, you're the winner. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, Gary, all you need to do is email me so I can get your address. I will do that. Cole, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. I saw a lot of friends in here. I wish I could say hi to everybody, but thank you so much for having me. And uh, boy, please feel free to write. If you have any questions you think of later, I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Man. Thank you. Awesome. Almost as good as, as Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear your story, Arthur. Thank you. A great right. presentation, Cole. Thank you. Awesome, man. That's great. Right. Thank, thank you. I guess I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you again, Cole. Okay. Good. Goodbye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Sandy. Bye. Thanks, Sandy. Thank Thanks, you, Arthur. Carl.